covering everything that you need to know and not experience. People applying for new positions is like the cherry on top. With the technology to attract talent. Recruiters always know their best talent. The AI just learned to use that information. Inclusion efforts across the organization. Tell me what it's like to work for through associate story. Interviews with leaders in the industry. Let's talk about what's new in HR tech. What are the hot topics? We're here every week, folks. Weekly look at the latest and greatest topics in HR. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Talent Experience Live. Uh, your look at everything that you need to know in talent acquisition, talent management, recruitment, and HR every single Thursday at noon Eastern time live on Phenom's LinkedIn channel. We here like to say that Talent Experience Live is the greatest show on the internet. Uh, so forget your favorite podcast, download this, and listen to it while you run, while you're in the gym, driving to work, dropping the kids off. Hey, maybe even while you sleep, because I promise you that you will find some great nuggets within this show. Uh, I'm your host, Devin Foster, and Town Experience Live is proudly bought, brought to you by the good folks here at Phenom, uh, whose purpose is to help a billion people find the right job. Now, that's not a typo. That's not a million. That's not a thousand. That is one billion. And they do so with the talent experience platform that helps candidates find the right fit faster. Employees evolve in their role beyond. Recruiters achieve some next level productivity and efficiency and managers build better data with the teams, analytics and automation and everything in between. All of this is powered by super slick AI and machine learning. Uh, head on over to phenom.com if you're interested. If any of those buzzwords caught your attention, you definitely want to check out and see what the good folks over at Phenom are doing. Today's episode is an encore edition of last week because it is a hot topic, uh, the recession, right? Everyone is talking about if you turn on your local news, if you hop on your social feeds, whatever it may be, everyone is talking about it. And we're talking about recruitment during a recession and or a slowdown. Uh, so on today's episode, we will have Nancy Gray Stockybaum, former VP of Talent Acquisition, share some of her insights uh, based on her experience on how to recruit through a recession. But before we get into that, it is tradition around these parts to always do an icebreaker question. So uh, I have heard that one thing that is always recession proof is chocolate. Uh, the folks in the chocolate industry refer to it as an affordable luxury. So for today's icebreaker question, I would love to know what your favorite chocolate is. I'll start with mine. Uh, mine is a Reese's peanut butter cup. Something about the perfect combination of chocolate and peanut butter uh, really puts all other candies to shame. Uh, and I'll let you in on a little secret. One of my favorite pastimes to enjoy a Reese's is the day after a very popular holiday. They do the Christmas trees, they do the Easter eggs. I think there's even pumpkins on Halloween's. But pro tip, if you go in, let's say November 1st, December 26th, or the day after Easter in April, their family size bags are ridiculously cheap and taste just as good as the expensive ones the day before. So definitely try that. Uh, looks like Jen Thomas is chiming in in the comments section. She says she loves Godiva. Uh, that's some high, high quality chocolate right there. No shame in that, Jen. I hope you get to treat yourself to some Godiva during the show. Um, so enough about chocolate. Uh, you came here to hear about recruiting during a recession. And I mentioned at the top of the program that we will be sharing last week's episode uh, from Nancy Gray Stockybaum chatting with Tom Tate and myself about her experiences, offering some advice as well as some tips and tricks during these uncertain times and how to recruit when you may not have as many job openings as before. Uh, I see Tom Tate joining in. Welcome, Tom. Uh, he says Raisinets. Uh, but only dark chocolate. So Tom, I hope you get to enjoy those as well. And without any further ado, uh, here's Nancy, Tom, and myself. Hey, 
Nancy, welcome. Um, hey, Devin, great to be here. Great to see you guys. Awesome. We are excited to have you on the program today and share with uh, us your wealth of knowledge that you have uh, around this topic. Um, but before we get into it, uh, we always love to hear, I know the promotion just happened on Tuesday, Tom announced, so congratulations. Um, can you tell you. us a little bit about your, your current role um, and also what you were doing before that that made the transition so great? The current role is of the role on Tuesday? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So client value realization is all about taking everything that we do at Phenom within our platform and starting to really understand how our clients are generating um, efficiency, effectiveness, time savings, and, and really getting value for all of the great things that they can do on the platform. And we've done some of this work, but there's so much more to do, especially as we as recruiters become more sophisticated in our approach to metrics and analytics. And, you know, definitely in a slowdown, you want to make sure you can show uh, the return on investment for your organization. Now, obviously, to, to take that transition and really advise our customer, you have to have a wealth of knowledge uh, from talent acquisition and from your experience. Um, and I know uh, Tom mentioned you know, previously, uh, you've worked in, in VP of talent acquisition here at Phenom, also elsewhere. So our favorite question that we always ask on this show is how did you get into HR and talent acquisition? Was it something that when you were a little girl, you grew up and said, I really want to recruit people for XYZ company? Or was it something that kind of just fell into your lap and, and the match was perfect? Yeah, you know, I originally wanted to be a track coach. I My undergrad is in physical education or kinesiology. And, uh, you know, there weren't any jobs that I really wanted to do out of that program. So I went and got an MBA and kind of fell into the people side of business and really developed a passion for recruiting about halfway through my career. Well, you know, um, maybe not halfway given the age I'm at now, but I was, I spent the first part of my career, you know, in the HR business partner side and got introduced to recruiting and absolutely fell in love with it as the, the fun, creative side of HR, where you could really make an impact in people's lives by matching them with that perfect position that would allow them to grow and prosper. So I've never, you know, I've, I've dipped in and out of it a little bit, but it is truly my first love from a business perspective. That's, that's awesome. And I love the background and track because in talent acquisition, there is so much running, running around <laughs> back and forth, yeah. open position over here. We need to hire this position. So it, perhaps it got you, you know, in, in the right shape for that <laughs> mindset of switching topics so quick. Uh, speaking of topics, Tom, I know we have a big one today, so I'll we hand do. the floor over to you. Yeah, definitely. And before we jump into that topic, uh, Nancy, I can't let you get away without answering the icebreaker question. So any uh, new music or anything that you've been listening to lately? <laughs> so um, my family would tell you that I don't really do new music. <laughs> sure. Yep. I, I grew up um, in the, well, anyway, the era that I grew yeah. up in, I listened to a lot of old stuff. But one of my favorite bands is the Tragically Hip, which is a Canadian, iconic Canadian oh, yeah. band. And it is Canada Day tomorrow here north of the u.s border so i will be listening so, to some tragically Hip and a few other smaller canadian uh lesser known bands love it love it awesome thank you so you know when we think about uh today's topic right really helping recruiters and talent acquisition teams get into a new mindset and 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 energize themselves you know through what might feel like a period of a slowdown uh recession comes to mind, right? And you're seeing that in the headlines. Uh, you know, we're here in the US. Um, Devin and I are here in the US. You know, we've seen a lot of different recessions over the past couple decades, right? For me personally, I, I graduated college, this will age me, but I graduated college right before the housing bubble burst, right? So it was really hard for me uh, to find work when I got out of college. It was a really interesting time to try to enter the workforce. Um, and that was one of the last slowdowns that I remember. And then, of course, when COVID hit, you know, we had an immediate slowdown, which picked up. And now we're entering this pre-recession period again. All signs kind of point to some potential trouble. So we want to talk about actionable tips and tactics that recruiters and talent acquisition teams can consider uh, when there might be a slowdown. Now, recession is not the only thing right that could cause a slowdown you know uh, talent acquisition teams are faced with this you know even during prosperous times right good times so what are some other causes that you've seen in your career uh that might cause slowdowns you know in the hiring process yeah and there are all kinds of different reasons for slowdowns i mean we're coming up to the biggest one in north america right now and, and most parts of europe which is summer 
Sure. Right. There's very little hiring that traditionally goes on in summer because candidates are on vacation, hiring managers are on vacation and kids are out of school. And so most people are not focused on changing jobs, career things. They do that at different times of the year, but the summer is just almost always slow all around. Um, if you're doing seasonal hiring to get ready for the summer, that's done by now. If you're doing season hire, seasonal hiring to get ready for Christmas or the, the holidays in the winter, that hasn't started yet. Sure. So summer's slow. That period in North America between um, the middle of December and the middle of January is another time that is traditionally slow. Budgeting, right? Budgets get set and then there's this hold during the end of the year as companies understand what their numbers are going to look like and decide whether they're going to release headcount or not. That's another typically slow time. And there can be factors that are particular to an industry or your own business. If you are um, uh, merging, being acquired, um, buying somebody else, or you're thinking about changing your strategy, those can all create a significant slowdown in talent acquisition. So if, if you're an, uh, if you want to be an agile and resilient recruiter or agile and resilient talent acquisition team, um, it's important to start to understand and, and ad ad adapt, you know, to these periods, you know, and I think if you're new to town acquisition and you're starting to experience this for the first time in a big way with a potential recession, there's a good opportunity to really sharpen th the saw, right. And, and, and get those skills and, and kind of soft skills in place. So I was curious, we're going to talk a lot about actionable, really tactical things that you can do, but is there a mindset shift that has to happen first? Uh, you know, for that eager, super hyperactive recruiter to start to step back and say, hey, you know, things are slowing down. What, what do I do now? Oh, 100%. <clears throat> Especially when you have a team that's been running full tilt, carrying, you know, 20, 30, 40 requisitions, even they are used to, you know, go, go, go. They're used to screening five to 10 candidates a day, you know, connecting with hiring manager, managers. It's like when you leave a company and, and take a period of time off, right? You have to come down from that. So that mind shift set goes from my value is by being busy and being on the phone all the time to my value comes from starting to think strategically about what can I do better? What can I put in place in order to make things go smoother or faster or be, be more efficient when things pick up? And what are things that I've always wanted to do, but I've just been too busy to do it? So there's a lot of things that leaders can do to help their teams um, make that shift. And part of it is helping them to understand, you know, that there's a whole lot of valuable things to be done that don't necessarily have to do with filling jobs. And that's a huge shift because recruiters are a lot like salespeople in a lot of way, right? They want to they, the hunt, they want to close the deal, they want to land the candidate. And, you know, there's a real there's a real feeling of satisfaction you get when that happens. And so in a slowdown, you don't get as much of that, but you have to find satisfaction in other things. That makes, that makes complete sense. Now it, you mentioned the, the go, go, go atmosphere, right? And, and recruiters may not have a complete time block of interviews coming up and things like that, but there are other activities. You mentioned sh shifting that mindset. What are some of those activities that they can focus on where if the slowdown turns into a, a speed up maybe, or a, a just the, you know, the, the floodgates open where people mm -hmm. need to be hired again. What can they do to prepare themselves for that without potentially interviewing candidates and having them there? Yeah. So, so I like to break it up into two things. One is what I call hygiene and maintenance. And the other thing is um, preparing for the future. And so those hygiene and maintenance things um, really come down to evaluating the systems and the tools and the technology that you have and how you've set them up. Are they working for you as best they can? You know, if you have a 50 step hiring process that's in a, a swim lane document, it's a great time to evaluate and, say, and say to yourself, wow, the 50 steps, is that what we should be doing? Or should we think differently and allow recruiters to have more creativity? Or do we not have enough steps for our, for our process and in our industry and in our business? So I think taking a look at some of those basic tools and just stepping back and saying, how is this work? Getting some feedback from your teams is important. That's part of the hygiene maintenance. We can dig into that more. I think the other piece is preparing for the future is, you know, my entire career, we've talked about building talent pipelines. And in times when recruiting is heavy, talent pipelines look like basically sending emails to like candidates telling them about jobs. 
but in a slowdown, there's a real craft that has to come into play. And this is really, to me, the art of recruiting, where you have to step back and segment those pipelines further so that there is some connectivity between the individuals in that pipeline. And then think about how you're going to engage, nurture, and connect with them in a really meaningful way when you might not be having a job to send to them. In fact, I would argue that in a slowdown, that's the wrong thing to do. Instead, what you might want to think about is how do I connect them with the thought leadership that's going on inside my company? Because almost every company will have thought leaders in particular skills or spaces. And how do you connect them by having those thought leaders write blogs? You know, something like this where they're doing a, a video or a, um, you know, they're at a conference presenting. How do you share that material appropriately with people who would really gravitate to it and who it would um, be of interest? I had an example where um, ISO has a series of HR metrics that they're thinking of setting up as a standard, well, they've set it up as a standard, but the SEC is thinking about implementing those metrics for publicly traded companies as an HR standard. <laughs> Very few people in my world know about this, but what a gift if someone sent that to me in an email campaign and said, hey, you know, this isn't related to joining our company or to a job, but as a professional, I thought you might be interested in knowing this. So there's a lot of different ways to connect with talent pools, and it's a great chance to use our creativity now. It, it, it's super interesting because when you think of recruitment, you think of talent acquisition, the call to action is always apply or get hired or whatever it may be. So you, you almost want to turn that off, right, it is what you're saying, because you don't want to give someone false hope. Now, you mentioned hygiene um, as well as nurturing there a little bit. I, I want to pose this question to you. Is it possible to potentially do both where you have a candidate that may have left you at the altar, right? Accepted another position um, to check in with them, you know, two, three months after they had gone through the interview process and say, hey, how are things going? Right. How's the new role? Um, I don't have anything for you right now. But when things go, I wanted to see if you're happy or you know what you liked about that organization so that I can be better at my job. Are those conversations encouraged uh, where they can you know, clean up some of the data that you mentioned uh, if somebody may have updated a phone number or email or whatever the case may be? Yeah, 100%. I mean, we're doing something at Phenom um, where we're starting to implement because we are, you know, the summer, everything is slowing down in the summer, of course. Um, it's sort of a, a 10 by 20 where we're looking at our 20 most critical roles and then looking at who are the 10 people that we would love to have joined the company in those areas with those skill sets. And it becomes um, not a quantity um, exercise, but a real quality exercise. And so part of nurturing those silver medalist candidates is really critical and important. And I think that candidates always appreciate when they've had a great recruiter experience, when that recruiter just reaches out to check in on them. I mean, there's something you know, kind of altruistic and really just nice and generous about giving a little bit of your time to that person that you spent, you know, quite a bit of uh, energy connecting and engaging in your brand. And I think it's a brilliant thing to do, you know, at this time. And, and that's when you can present to the business those deep talent pipelines and be able to really articulate why those candidates or prospects are in those pipelines. I think that's where, you know, one of the, one of the key ways to become a trusted talent acquisition advisor or partner. Yeah, I, I love this theme too. Uh, we explored this pretty extensively with Luba, our colleague Luba on a previous episode. And uh, we'll have to find the link and put that in, in the notes here so people can check that out. Uh, we're always interested in facilitating the transformation of the recruiter from being kind of the, the deli uh, ticket taker, you know, take your ticket, let me know what your order is, and I'll go fulfill your order to really becoming the trusted talent advisor. Um, so this idea that you mentioned of uh, seeking out thought leadership uh, at your organization, seeking out content uh, that is meaningful, that is valuable, and sharing that proactively with, with candidates as a way to kind of build pipeline and nurture uh, is, is really exciting to me. Um, now, if a, rec a recruiter doesn't know where to get that content, right? So maybe this is an another mindset shift, right? Uh, so I'm curious, Nancy, w what would you encourage a recruiter uh, to do or what kind of behaviors do you think they can start adopting um, to, again, build up that wealth of knowledge, right? And build relationships, you know, so that they can start to 
know what to send and know how to do that because it might be a, a shift. It might be a huge change for someone who's just used to kind of the transactional conversations of recruiting. Yeah, I, you know, it is a shift. It's definitely a mindset shift, of, yeah. mindset shift. And we see that with our customers, um, you know, as they're learning to use our platform and our campaign tools. I think, you know, one of the first things to do is to talk to those people who are experts in your organization within that talent pool and just ask them, like, what would you love? What could a recruiter or somebody like me send you that you would find interesting that would cause you to open and engage with the material? And we've got great examples of some best practices, you know, around things like newsletters that have, you know, different things for different people. If you're engaging with finance, um, senior finance executives, for instance, might be interested in things about your company if you're releasing your management circular, or if you've got your investor call, simple links to that, right? You know, and keep in mind that those messages should be short and sweet um, because they're probably not going to read more than a couple of sentences. But but that's valuable information to them, right? So they don't have to go and search it. You're just sending them a link. For somebody who is a new grad or relatively new in the workforce, corporate social responsibility is huge. So what can you send them about your corporate res social responsibility, your employee resource groups, or interesting dynamics that are shifting in the workplace from a general culture and values? I mean, right, right now, the return to work is a really big topic for a lot of people, and especially I think for um, you know early talent, I mean, for all of us, but early talent is really thinking about where do they wanna live and work because they have all kinds of flexibility in choosing where they wanna be. Yeah. And so um, there, there are, so, so there's the go and get the expert opinion, but then talk to people within your organization who represent, who are representative of that pipeline of talent that you wanna nurture and get their perspective and then, I always say just be creative, right? Make people laugh. Um, I love the idea of giving social currency in any email campaign because we all look for social currency even when we're working at home to share at the dinner table or when we're you know sitting around after dinner, whatever. You want that funny, humorous thing that you learned. So if you can share a piece of social currency that's relevant to your industry, to the pipeline, and there are so many factoids out there that are fun um, and I just think that connecting with candidates should be fun and energizing and, you know, a little bit of give and take. Yeah, we've got a great uh, affirmation from Eric here. Eric, thank you so much for joining us today. Very good info on nurturing. Appreciate it. Eric, I'm curious, you know, what you've done in the past for nurturing too. Feel free to chime in uh, in the comments here. Um, love the idea of social currency, right? It, the deposits and withdrawals. And, and if you're not making actionable deposits, uh, you're likely making withdrawals or you're just completely stagnant, right? So super important to, to think about it that way. So I love that you were able to put it that way. Um, talent acquisition uh, leaders, managers, people who are running these teams, right? And trying to lead these teams through slowdowns and through challenging times. You've mentioned earlier that, you know, the, the impetus for a recruiter to get up in the morning uh, might be a set of metrics that are no longer relevant. So is it important for leaders to think about um, putting new metrics in place or recalibrating with the team to say that, hey, we're shifting and, you know, success rate on this email campaign is going to look different and that's okay. You know, like, do you recommend ha uh, leaders having those conversations to kind of guide the team? Oh, a hundred percent. And I think that the more you can engage the team, especially if you're, if your business is slowing down for, for whatever reason, you know, recession, economy, seasonality, whatever, engaging the team and thinking through how you measure value and what different things look like in experimenting in a slower time is a really great thing to do. So part of understanding what resonates with your pipeline is measuring those experiments. And to your point, seeing what campaigns resonate and why, and then really digging into not the surface level of the why, but digging into um, really understanding why one type of campaign might resonate with a tech group and why it might not res resonate with your distribution center employees. So that you're starting to build those best practices that make sense for your organization, your talent pools and your industry. And I think that's that's a really great time. The other thing is, if a recruiter is generally measured by filling a number of recs and you're slowing down right now because or, or time to fill and you know that your time to fill is going to take longer because candidates are on vacation and hire managers are on vacation, then 
moving away from those metrics and starting to, you know, maybe break the team up into projects to do some of that hygiene and maintenance work. We have, for example, in our phenom platform, we have a plethora of tags. We have over 3,000. Most of those tags have never been used and they're a legacy from our particular tenant um, having been used for demos. So the team is going to clean those up now because we only need probably about 100. But I think, you know, even when I, when I, um, my last big corporate gig, um, we had what we called e questions. And I remember sitting down and looking at all of the e questions we had. And we had over 5,000 for a team of, I don't know, about 25 recruiters. And there were more than 100 questions around how to ask for compensation because we had so many questions that instead of finding the right one, somebody would just make up a new one. It would be, what's your annual salary? How much do you make annually? <laughs> right. Yeah. And so everybody will have that stuff in their system that needs to be cleaned up. And this is a really great time to do it. And the more you clean up and, you know, get the system efficient, the more the more effective and efficient your recruiters will be in turn. That makes a, a ton of sense. One thing you mentioned uh, specifically was making deposit into into social currencies. Right. And I thought popped into my head. Um, is there any value to a recruiter or, or somebody on the talent acquisition team creating thought leadership content for candidates, right? Um, you know, best tips for video interviews, um, what fonts to stay away from on your resume. Comic Sans is a big no-no in my book. Other companies <laughs> yeah. may have a, a different opinion, um, but sharing some of that content uh, where you offer value um, as opposed to, you know, just, hey, this is what we're doing. Because I think a combination of both could really grow your, your talent pool where people are, are coming to your content and trying to, to learn, right? And, and better themselves, even if it isn't at your organization. Have you seen uh, something like that be, be successful? Yeah, and that's a really awesome point, right? Is what can you do for your candidates? So there are, um, you know, one of the things that recruiting teams excel at is interviewing. And they really can, you know, provide value to candidates in having them understand what are great interview questions and what aren't. And I do a lot of, um, I have a lot of people who come to me. I mean, I'm the HR person for my entire extended family. And they always want to know how to practice or prep for an interview. And I think that's a gift that recruiters can give to your talent pools. You know, um, at Phenom, we've done it in the past where we've had events where, um, and we did it for students, where they could learn um, some of our best practices around preparing for interviews, right? And I think that, you know, not only interviews, but resume writing, you know, cover letters are, are something that people are always asking about um, how, to, how to write a good cover letter. So anything that your team can do to, to connect and, um, you know, show off the culture of your company by interacting with candidates in a way that might not necessarily result in a role or position today, but will result in opportunities down the road, I think is an amazing thing to do. And this is the right time to do it. You mentioned show off your, your company culture. Are there internal activities that, that recruiters can do to, to showcase that? Um, maybe it's you create user generated content for a day in the life or something like that, or you know what someone's home office looks like if you're hiring remotely or something like that is that something that that is encouraged and also when you're creating that externally facing content should you run it through certain channels to make sure that it's on brand that you're not saying that something potentially the organization isn't behind or doesn't represent your company in a certain way what do those look like and, and how do recruiters avoid some of those pitfalls yeah you know another brilliant idea Devin, and i think that um user generated content candidates love it because it's genuine right and we are all used to youtube videos and and you know i swear that my um son almost everything he's learned he's learned from by watching youtube videos and including how to do extensive car maintenance on his on his vehicle so we are always looking for things that are genuine and we're very suspicious of glossy corporate generated content when it comes to culture right we're looking for those behind the scenes insights into how employees live their lives working for your organization so having competitions for photos that's really simple right show us what you're doing this summer having a landing page on your career site where you can showcase um, different seasonal events and activities right we just went through pride month um being able to showcase pride month photos that have been 
generated and taken by your employees participating in Pride activities is amazing because it really gets to the heart of your company and 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 how you you know are diverse and inclusive. So you can do competitions. You can ask them you know to do to do videos and and small vignettes of how they love their job or how how they resonate with your values and culture. I always think that running that through marketing is a great idea if you've got a supportive marketing organization like we do here at Phenom, because marketers are the brand guardians and talent acquisition should also be brand guardians, but they can teach your organ your recruiting team um, really how to speak in the voice of your organization as well, which I think is, is important. So there are so many activities that be, can be done both internally and externally to set yourselves up for just being a better recruiting machine uh, in the future. And, and we should take advantage of that while we're in a, you know, if you're in a slowdown or while you're in a slowdown, or if you have extra headcount. That that makes complete sense. And one thing that I you mentioned there was career site, right? Is that something that you could potentially use during this downtime is, is updating it and maybe posting some of that uh, not as glossy content? I know marketers will lose their heads um, if we say, hey, you can just post the cell phone video onto the career site. Um, but is that something that you can take time and, and look at? You know, you mentioned seasonality, showcasing the, the seasons throughout um, mm -hmm. or a, a what's happening here sort of page where you can get that genuine concept uh, and also keep candidates up to date there. You recommend that? Yeah, absolutely. And not only, you know, updating your career site, because I think that's really important. Your career site should really be a living a living space where the content changes frequently and is and is fresh. I think candidates are really looking for that. And you want them to return to your career site often to really um, engage with your culture and make the right decision for them if they're going to be interested in joining your organization. But, you know, here at Phenom, we actually have a new career site that we've been working on. We're just waiting to launch it. But throwing up things like landing pages to explain parts of your recruiting process, that's a great way to engage with candidates to showcase a particular geographic region, country, a new office, a new line of business, to showcase some of the leadership um, and allow candidates to feel like they're interacting one-on-one -on -one with them through video capture, video content, um, articles, blog posts, anything like that, I think is really amazing. And especially if you can measure it. So at Phenom, we can measure through our analytics tool, um, time on page, uh, exits and, and bounce rates and things like that, that will, again, as you experiment with content, really help to um, focus you on what resonates with your talent pool and the people who are attracted to your organization. And I think that's amazing. And so often we're so busy, we just don't have time to do that. So right. embrace those things now. Yeah, find a way, right? When you have the time to really dive deeper and, and all of that too, will continue to build on this idea of becoming a talent advisor, right? Not just a recruiter, you are a talent advisor and you're able to point to specific landing pages and point to the analytics and data behind it and say, hey, this is resonating. This is actually doing the job that we needed to do. Uh, Megan chimed in and said, uh, she's never heard of social currency, uh, but she loves the idea, always looking for a way uh, for the brand to positively engage with the audience, right? And I think that um, social currency uh, and this idea of engaging with the audience has never been more critical. Uh, when you think about the way that candidates and the way that employees are engaging with brands today at that level, uh, it is so public, right? And, and it's happening in real time and it's happening every single day, right? So when we think about, you just said, hey, take take time to update the career site. Critical because the career site is kind of a window into the culture of the organization. It, it is how candidates get a, a clear view. Uh, but the other window is just scrolling through LinkedIn and seeing what people are saying about your brand and your company and decisions that they're making. Um, you know, so quickly when there are layoffs, news outlets will report on the layoffs, employees will have their own hot takes. Um, and you're just seeing all that unfold. Uh, we also have so many things happening um, just in terms of brands engaging with uh, things that are happening socially and politically, right? This is no longer is this relegated to just Facebook, you know, where friends and family are talking about their opinions. Um, everyone is looking to see what does this organization stand for? What does this organization stand for? And uh, depending upon that answer, it really will determine 
whether or not a candidate or employee wants to continue that relationship. So recruiters now have this, this role, right, that they might not have had before where they need to be uh, kind of a spokesperson for that as well, right? And, and a voice for that and be able to connect on that level. So Nancy, how should a recruiter navigate this? Um, should they be having the hard conversations? Should they be avoiding the hard conversations? What do you think on this whole topic? Yeah, you know, and this is a big one. The the LinkedIn posts um, over the last week and a half have been fascinating. And I, I've been glued to them, just reading them. And so many things going on for, for so many people, you know, globally. And I think that, you know, recruiters are often the front line of how uh, future talent is feeling about what's happening in the world. And it's important that they feel like they can bring that back into the organization and get the support they need. And generally that will come from marketing um, or a PR organization. So, you know, if you feel like you need to respond, you know, I always believe that you go to marketing and say, I need some talking points for this. Because especially right now, I think what you say and how you say it is critical and you have to be as transparent as you can be, but as genuine as you can be. And if your organization doesn't have a response or an answer to something that's happening politically or socially, I think that's okay. Um, and, but you need the talking point on how to share that because some organizations respond very quickly and other organizations spend a lot of time figuring out their, you know, from, from a long-term perspective, how they can support different initiatives or, you know, how they want to respond. And a lot of it has to do with the internal workings of your organization, right? I've worked at companies where it was a year to craft a response because they were very conservative, had a brand that they wanted to protect, things like that. And there were a lot of layers and levels that you had to go through to respond to, to world events. Other organizations can respond on a dime, it seems. So, so understanding your organization, making sure you're not personally frustrated by a quick response or a lack of response, and then working with your marketing organization to get those talking points that you can use both in verbal conversations and in written material, I think is really critical. And marketing and, and recruiting should have a really deep, tight partnership. How do you feel about um, communication from a recruiter to a candidate? Uh, you know, moving away from kind of the social and political issues, but thinking about uh, as we move closer to a potential recession, you know, one week uh, you might have all these open rec recs, right? And things are looking great. And then the next week, you know, you hear from HR that, you know, a certain uh, piece of the organization had to lay off 20%, right? And then all of a sudden you're cutting back on those open recs. You had people in the process, maybe people had two or three interviews already. Um, you know, how do we communicate when we're kind of moving through that uncertainty uh, without upsetting people that were in the process, but, you know, we don't want to let them go because the role might still be open, but we're really not sure kind of what, what the uh, future holds. Yeah. You know, I think that the biggest thing that recruiters need to do is really manage the expectations of candidates. And um, at one of my uh, previous roles, I had executive recruiting and executive recruiting is all about uh, providing that white glove service. And what happens with executive recruiting is you're recruiting leaders for other leaders and their schedules are incredibly busy <laughs> and ever changing. <clears throat> and so a process that you think and you might agree might take four to six weeks can take three to four months because of schedules and, and demands on busy executives, both on the candidate side and the the um, hiring leader side and so you really learn in that role to connect often frequently updates manage expectations and i think that that needs to happen as well with candidates that everyone has i mean it's super hard when you have a high volume role and you're managing maybe 100 candidates but i think you know you can use things like automations with your technology to share messaging around you know what is going on and Everybody understands that business decisions happen. Things happen that are out of our control. And, <clears throat> you know, the, the best thing that you can do as a recruiter is be as transparent as you can. 
<clears throat> I don't mind, you know, I don't mind wasting my time going through an interview process. You know, if I'm getting updates that says, um, you know, this is going to take longer. So-and-so is on vacation for two weeks. So we won't have any updates for, for two and a half weeks. That's fine. If the role has changed or gone away, it's good to share that with a candidate and just say, you know, we are right now reevaluating some of our hiring because of some changes that are going on with the business. So just bear with us. And I'll keep you updated. The worst thing a recruiter can do is have somebody come in for interviews and then not get back to them. Right. And I can't tell you yep. from time to time, I like to interview because I like to see what's, you know, what the experience is like, what's happening, um, you know, kind of as a, a benchmark for our own internal process. And there's nothing worse than than never hearing back. Right. We're so quick to reach out on LinkedIn and through other means to gather candidates in and connect with them and have those yeah. initial conversations. And then, you know, often because of how busy recruiters are, things fall by the wayside. So we have tools and automations that help us engage with candidates in a way that takes, you know, a nanosecond instead of, you know, 20 minutes. So we, so we leverage those tools ourselves and it really makes a difference to your candidate experience. But transparency, I think, is as being as transparent as you can is key. Do you think you have to be very forward about perks too uh, and, and just general working environment stuff because I, I i'm thinking about a certain ceo who i won't name who said that hey if you don't come back to the office for 40 uh hours a week uh you're no longer allowed to to work remotely and you're no longer allowed to you shouldn't be working here um you know and that's a huge shift right so if you were a recruiter at said company and you were saying yeah 80 percent of our workforce is working remote and you can too you know i don't know if 80 percent is the right number but you know, you can too. And then all of a sudden that happens, you know, shortly after that person gets hired, they were hired off of false pretenses, you know? So um, do you feel like, but you also don't want to scare an employee, right? Or a candidate, you know? So how, how is there a line to, to be drawn there? Yeah, I, you know, this is, the world is changing right now in so many different fronts. And we have all kinds of companies who are trying to figure out, you know, yes. what is this new way of working? And especially, I got to tell you, especially in the summer, I have a, um, a friend who is a, works at a very large bank, who for the first time in a very long career had been able to spend the last two summers working at their cottage remotely and actually spent the summer, two summers with their family, you know, being able to leave work and, and walk into the water at the beach <laughs> and enjoy and really enjoy the summer. And now, is back at work in a large city and that's really hard and especially when you've been able to do your job remotely so i think that i always think that as a recruiter you can speak to your experience and what it's like for you and how you value the culture and then i think you can talk to you you know sort of that larger experience because nothing is black and white in our world today right there are all kinds of different things and here at Phenom, we have people who are going back into the office. And I think that we have people who, who are grateful to be able to go back into an office all the time. And then there are people who, you know, don't want to be in the office more than a day or two a week. And, and we need to give each other grace as we work through what is this new world like, especially I think of the price of gas. I used to commute 150 kilometers one way for a job that I loved right? That took anywhere from two to four hours one way. I did that for four and a half years. With the price of gas today, <laughs> yeah. that would be significantly impacting my lifestyle if I still had to do that. So I think that you can, you know, you can share what's happening today with, uh, with Candace and you can talk about what you understand may be happening. But I think that, you know, letting candidates know that you don't have a policy nailed down yet or that things are shifting and that we try to accommodate. I think those are different things that you can use. I mean, it is as clear as mud, mud right now, what the work life is going to look like in the next 12 months, uh, globally. Yes. Yep, globally. Right? I don't think anybody has really figured that out. I feel like we're all in phase two of the of the pandemic experiment right <laughs> right now, right? Phase one was just getting through the first two years. And now phase two is what do we do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, earlier, uh, Nancy said that she was going to try her best not to swear on air. And and I saw just the struggle is real. I saw this, <laughs> it was almost there. It was almost there. We almost got it out of, of Nancy, but but she she did a great job uh, 
uh, keeping this PG, uh, PG 13 <laughs> today. So thank you, Nancy. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and yeah, we're, 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 we're figuring it out. I mean, uh, here in, in Pennsylvania, uh, there was a company based out of Pittsburgh, uh, who said, Hey, if you're going to roll back human rights, if you're going to roll back human rights in the state, we're going to have to reconsider our headquarters, you know? And like, yeah. that's a, that's a real thing, you know, that's happening. And I think that, um, it, there's, uh, ripple effects, you know, to everything that's happening, you know, whether it's social, uh, social, um, political issues, whether it is, uh, human rights issues, whether it is a recession, economic issues, we are dealing, you know, with ripple effects, you know, that are not, uh, absolutes to your point, there is no black and white, you know, uh, to all my star Wars fans out there, only a Sith deals in absolutes. <laughs> okay. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. So, uh, Devin, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, no, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I did have one, one last question before we wrap things up, Nancy, we talked about becoming talent advisors, uh, instead of just going through the process and things when, you know, these, these hiccups come about, how important is it for recruiters to talk to someone on the phone or virtually rather than sending an email for maybe somebody who is at the final stage. We talk so frequently about the fear of candidates ghosting or something like that. How important is it to have those in a human way as opposed to just sending out maybe a, a, an absolute black and white email that says, hey, we're not hiring anymore, sorry. Um, and could you, could you tell us a little bit about that and how to navigate that conversation? Yeah, so you know what? That's a really tough one, Devin, because Right now, I don't know about you, but but I get probably 10, 20 calls a, a week that are from, I don't know, robots that, you know, it's not English. Uh, they're crank, not, well, we would, would have called them crank calls when we were kids, but they're, you know, phishing calls, whatever. And so if I don't recognize a number, I don't pick it up. Right. So we're dealing with that. And it's really hard for me to say this because... Uh, you know, if you talk to one of my previous teams, you know, I was so frustrated with them not picking up the phone and talking to candidates that I, I took them on a, um, a field trip and we went in the subway system in Toronto and I made them speak to strangers and gather information about them because I think that's a really great, and they still talk about it um, and hate me for it. But I think it's a really important skill for recruiters to have that ability to cold call. But now we have to balance that with the fact that people aren't comfortable picking up cold calls because of all the nefarious things that happen via via the phone these days. If you've got a relationship, then I think absolutely. If you've talked to a candidate in person, absolutely setting up time to speak to them and 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 talk to them is really important, especially because that human connection, after all, is what candidates are looking for when they decide to join an organization. I think though that um, that for the most part, people are very cautious about who they spend time speaking to. I mean, I don't know about you. I'm sure you guys are the same, but most of my day is spent on Zoom calls. I don't even call my friends at night. I'm exhausted by by yep. by talking. So I think you have to be respectful. I think text, text messaging is fine. We're all used to it. It's quick and short and simple. Um, I don't know how many people listen to voicemails these days. I never listen to voicemail. So you really need to think about What's the right way to reach this person? And if it's somebody who enjoyed speaking on the phone, speak to them. If it's somebody who wants that quick, short and sweet text message, then text them. But I think personalization is really important. And we need to explore the ways that technology can help us deliver that personalized experience on a daily basis for both our candidates and our hiring managers. Yeah, that's that's perfect. And I completely understand. I have gotten a robocall since we've been on the show. So <laughs> I, I understand. Um, any final thoughts, Nancy? Anything that you'd like to, to wrap up with or, or leave the viewers with? Yeah, I, you know, if you're a recruiter, I, you know, and you're in a slowdown right now, first of all, take care of yourself. Take that vacation that you've been putting off. You know, take Friday afternoon off to go join your family at the beach or whatever it is that you do. But look after yourself because we know that recruiting can be a crazy world. And then I think look for those ways that you've always dreamed of to add value to the business and start acting on them, whether it's getting deep knowledge about your talent pool or, you know, thinking about metrics and how you can share them with the business, reevaluating all of your hiring processes, or just going back and looking at what worked well, what didn't work well, and what can I improve? There's so much work that we can do when we have the gift of time. That's, that's awesome. Well, Nancy, you should take all of tomorrow off, not just <laughs> the afternoon. Uh, I know it's a Canadian holiday, so I hope you enjoy yourself. Tom, anything you'd like to add? 
no nancy just thank you so much uh this has been yeah, uh this has been an educational but also a really fun and, and great episode uh to talk about something that's challenging you know so it's great that we can we can do this we really appreciate it awesome thanks so much for having you guys and happy july 4th as well thank you thank you That was awesome. Thank you so much, Nancy and Tom. Lots of great information there. Uh, if you wanted to catch the replay again, or perhaps follow up with the blog, head to our uh, blogphenom.com backslash blog, or you can always watch the replay on YouTube or LinkedIn, wherever it is easiest for you. Um, as I said, uh, a lot coming in the future with the recession, right? Where there's so much uncertainty. I think there's some, some great tips. Uh, today's Thursday. Happy Thursday to you, Jonathan Harrison. Uh, tomorrow's Friday. Maybe take uh, a little bit of advice from Nancy. Take tomorrow afternoon off. Monday, 7-Eleven day. Head down to your local 7-Eleven. Pick up some chocolate like we talked about at the top of the program and maybe even a free slushie if they still do that. Uh, tune in next Thursday. We are going to be unpacking the state of candidate experience uh, from 2022. That is where we took a look at the Fortune 500 as well as the European 100 and audited their career sites. So we're going to be joined by Sally Hartnell. I definitely don't want to miss that episode. And if you want to get your career site audited, and perhaps you're not in the European 100 or Fortune 500, you can always do so if you download the report. Uh, there's a nice banner on phenom.com where you can also learn a bit more about the talent experience. Uh, that does it for today's episode. Shout out to Nancy. Shout out to Tom. Shout out to Jonathan. Shout out to Jen. Shout out to Justin Je Devitt behind the screen doing the ones and twos. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week, and we'll see you next Thursday. Thanks.